Now let's look at the basic principles of terrestrial planet geology. These principles also work for the moons of the planets as well. Astronomers and planetary geologists have several types of observations and techniques to figure out what's inside a planet. The planets have flattened spherical shapes from the action of gravity and the centrifugal effect of their rotation. The amount of the rotational flattening is the oblateness. The amount of flattening also depends on the fluidity or elasticity of the interior's material. If you compare the overall total average density of the planet as a whole with the density of the surface material, you can find out how much differentiation has occurred. Differentiation is the process by which gravity separates materials according to density, with the high density materials like iron and nickel sinking toward the core, and low density materials like silicate rock and carbon compounds floating upward. We can determine the composition of surface and atmosphere material from landers or remotely with spectroscopy. The presence of a magnetic field requires the interior to have a liquid metallic component. So if there's a global magnetic field, it means there must be some liquid metal in the interior. By carefully observing the rotation of a planet, you can detect the precession wobbling of its rotation axis. The rate or speed of that precession depends on how much the mass is concentrated toward the center. For example, the Earth's core is considerably denser than its surface, and the Jovian planets have an even greater concentration of their mass at their cores. The tiny twists in a terrestrial planet's spin can be used to determine if the core is solid or liquid. You can illustrate this by comparing the spin of a raw egg and the spin of a hard-boiled egg. You will notice that the raw egg's spin slows down very quickly because of the fluid inside sloshing about. The mass distribution of a planet can be probed by observing the motions of satellites, moons, or spacecraft in the planet's gravitational field. Mass lumps in the surface layer can be detected as well as asymmetries in the overall mass distribution. For example, the center of the moon's mass is two kilometers closer to the Earth than the center of its overall shape, the geometric center. The moon's crust on the Earth's facing side is several kilometers thinner than the crust on the far side. This is probably a remnant of the Earth's gravity acting on the early moon's molten interior billions of years ago. Mars' center of mass is north of the geometric center. This is associated with the fact that Mars' southern crater highlands stand about four kilometers higher than the northern volcanic plains. The rate of heat loss from the warm interior and the rate at which the temperature increases at greater depths, closer to the core, are important parameters for determining the interior structure. On the Earth, scientists can drill several kilometers into the crust and measure the temperature difference between the bottom of the hole and near the top. The Mars InSight lander was supposed to bore a temperature probe almost 5 meters into Mars's surface to measure the temperature profile down to that depth, but it wasn't able to bore down far enough. For the Jovian planets, infrared telescopes are able to detect their large heat flows. For the terrestrial planets, the most useful data comes from seismology, the study of the interior from observations of how seismic waves planet quake waves, travel through the interior. Seismic waves slightly compress rock or cause it to vibrate up and down. They are produced when parts of a planet's crust suddenly shift and can be felt on the surface as a quake. The speed, amplitude, and direction the seismic waves move depend on the particular type of wave and the material they pass through. Just as a physician can use an ultrasound to get a picture of your anatomy or of a fetus, you can use seismic waves to get a picture of the Earth's interior, though it is a bit cruder than the physician's ultrasound. Earthquakes will produce two main types of waves, P, pressure waves, and S, shear waves. P waves are like sound waves. Matter in one place pushes against adjacent matter compressing it. 
The result is a series of alternating stretched and compressed rock propagating in the same direction as the compression. It is like what happens when you stretch out a slinky horizontally on a long table and give one end a sudden horizontal shove. You will see a wave of compressed metal coil move across the length of the slinky to the other end. P waves can travel through solid and liquid material and move faster than S waves. S waves are like waves in a jerked rope. Matter moves up and down or side to side. Liquid matter prevents S waves from spreading. Timing of the arrival of seismic waves from at least three stations in a triangular array allows the earthquake center to be located. Seismometers on the opposite side of the Earth from the earthquake detect only P waves, so there must be liquid material in the Earth's core. The size of the liquid core can be constrained from how far away a seismometer can be and still detect both S and P waves. Seismic waves refract or bend inside the Earth because of the change in the speed of the waves as they pass through material of variable density, composition, and temperature. Abrupt changes in direction occur at the boundary between two different layers. Here is a brief overview of what we found for the Earth's interior. There is a solid inner core about 1,300 kilometers in radius, or 20% of the Earth's radius, with a density of 14 times that of water. It is made of an iron-nickel alloy with a small percentage of sulfur, cobalt, and other minerals. The liquid outer core extends out to 3,500 kilometers radius, or 55% Earth's radius, with a density of 12. The mantle is hot, but not quite molten, iron-rich silicate materials like olivine and pyroxene, and is around 2,800 kilometers, or out to 99% of the Earth's radius. The density increases from about 3.5 below the crust to over 5 at the core boundary. Even though the mantle is not liquid, it can deform and slowly flow when stressed. Convective motions in the mantle rub on the crust to produce earthquakes and volcanoes. This convective motion is very slow compared to a human lifetime. It can take several tens of millions of years for a chunk of rock to move from the inner boundary of the mantle to just below the crust. The crust has a density of about 3. Fortunately for us, the crust is a poor conductor of heat, so we're able to walk around comfortably on the surface while the interior is up to 6,300 Kelvin, nearly 11,000 degrees Fahrenheit, at the center. The very upper layer of the mantle and the crust make up a relatively cool, rigid rock layer called the lithosphere that floats on a warmer, softer, more pliable rock layer beneath it called the asthenosphere. Small plants have very thick lithospheres that extend from the surface to almost the core or all the way to the core. Large planets will have thin lithospheres because they still retain a lot of heat. Earth's lithosphere is thin enough to be cracked into chunks called plates. Oceanic plates are made of basalt, which is cooled volcanic rock, composed of silicon, oxygen, iron, aluminum, and magnesium. They are about 6 kilometers thick. The continental plates are around 20 to 70 kilometers thick and are made of another volcanic type of silicate called granite. With a density of 2.7, they are less dense than the oceanic plates. The last picture is a cutaway drawing of the eight planets, one planet per quadrant. The terrestrial planets on the left are all to the same scale. The Jovian planets on the right are all to the same scale, and I have the entire Earth shown here. Next slide. Large enough planets will still have enough interior heat to be geologically active, producing volcanism and tectonics. Because planet interiors are warmer than outer space, energy will flow outward from the interior toward the surface. There are three possible sources of heat in a planet's interior. One is the heat of accretion during its formation, 
dust, pebbles, and rocks stuck together as they were gravitationally attracted together in the planet's formation, releasing gravitational potential energy. A second source is during differentiation, loss of gravitational potential energy as the denser material sunk to the core. Both of those sources occur early in a planet's history. The primary source today, billions of years later, is the heat from radioactive decay of unstable atomic nuclei, uranium-238, uranium-235, thorium-232, and potassium-40. Everywhere in the universe, energy flows from hot to cold places through three ways. Number one, radiation, meaning electromagnetic radiation, glowing. Nature will try to use this first, but in the case of rock, radiative transfer is not used because light cannot pass through it. Number two, if the temperature difference between the hot and cold places is too large for radiation to handle the load, nature kicks in convection, which is bulk motions of the fluid. You have large-scale chunks of the material cycling hot material upward to cooler regions and then back down as it cools off to then get warmed up again like an energy conveyor belt. Convection occurs in the core and mantle. In the mantle, the convection is slow by human standards, just one centimeter per year, or about as fast as your fingernails grow. So it takes about a hundred million years for rock to flow from the bottom of the mantle to the top. Number three, conduction, is particle by particle where individual particles transfer energy to other individual particles. Conduction occurs very slowly in the crust and the top of the mantle below the crust and is much faster in the metallic core. Larger planets lose their heat from formation and radioactive decay more slowly than small planets. A planet with a larger volume than another planet of the same composition will start off with a larger supply of heat energy. In addition, the heat in a large planet's interior has a great distance to travel to reach the planet's surface and the cold outer space. The rate of heat loss increases with the surface area. A planet with a larger surface area than another planet with the same internal temperature will have a larger rate of heat loss. The time it takes for a planet to cool off depends on the total amount of heat stored divided by the rate of heat loss, or its volume divided by its surface area, which means the cooling time is proportional to the planet's diameter. Even though its heat loss rate is greater, a larger planet has a much larger amount of energy stored in it, and thus it will take longer to cool off than a smaller planet.